you so much for Hopper to, to host this series and for you to say yes to this conversation, Rob. Um, we've uh, known each other for quite some time now. Um, and right now, I've, I find like in this series, the series is in general about the role of artists and creative practitioners in stimulating, envisioning, um, catalyzing regenerative culture in, di in diverse ways. Um, but I can't help myself but having the opportunity to talk to you about this um, to start somewhere else, which is when you started the Transition Town Impulse in 2006 in Totnes and even before that in Kinsale, um, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, you still saw a path of through the eye of the um, needle, a path that we could actually descend from this crazy civilization that we've built into a much more, um, much more higher quality of life and um, lower impact on the planet or even positive impact on the planet. But how do you see what has happened since? Because just to give you my framing, like since my book came out in 2016, I now feel I'm not quite as positive that the window of opportunity is still big enough to squeeze through. And um, the conversations around collapse are everywhere suddenly. Um, and in many ways we could say we've been in collapse for decades, um, at least the last 50 years since the UN conference on the environment, we knew that something is collapsing and we're probably to blame for it. Um, where do you see yourself in this? And particularly like bringing the bridge back from this sort of facing the abyss to creativity and imagination. So, um, yeah, lovely to see you. It's been far too long. And thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. And hello to everybody who is uh, doing us the great honor of actually watching this. Um, thank you. Um, I guess for me, I, I feel like the work that I do really, uh, you know, in the last IPCC report, they said something like there is a brief and rapidly closing window uh, of opportunity to ensure a survivable future or something or other, you know, and it's like, for me, while they're even if I remember talking to Kevin Anderson at, at, at COP in Glasgow mm -hmm. last year and he said he said the bad news is we've got about a five percent chance the good news is we've got a five percent chance mm -hmm. <laughs> so so for me I I feel like okay if there's any kind of a window left it's not like we don't know what we have to do mm -hmm. you know we're everything it's not like we're waiting for someone to invent some magic device or some magic machine we know everything we need to do to stabilize things and we even you know according to some people have if we do everything all the stuff that's in in drawdown you know we know that we could then stabilize and be drawing stuff down it's 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 at the far end of the of the um of the not that likely spectrum but it is still there and we could still do it and i guess for me the work that i do is around we could do this stuff we know, we know it's all there. We know how to do it all. The fact that our current world leaderships are going in the other direction at a huge pace, does that mean we just give up? I, you know, I, I feel like I, we know who all those people are and I refuse, absolutely refuse to give those people the gift of my despair of my despondency it's like i feel like as a father like you are i feel like pessimism is a luxury that i don't have every tiny fraction of a degree is something that we have to that that, that matters and you know the work that i do is really around is really around you know there are people there are lots of people who are doing work on collapse and it's really important and it's really important that we have those processes and things in place for for the grief and for managing all of that but i feel like we can't shut that window and say we could though we could 
And if we did, what would it be like? You know, so a lot of the stuff that I do with people is, what would it be like if we did everything in the next 10, 15 years that we had to do? What would it be like to live through that time? It would be like we lived through a revolution of the imagination when anything felt possible. And, you know, if you look back through history, it took 10 years from Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat on that bus mm. to uh, to the Civil Rights Act being passed in America. 10 years from the first international sanctions on South Africa to uh, to the new constitution being passed there. We know we saw during COVID if if governments decide to move things along really quickly, then they can. And maybe just maybe with what's happening in Ukraine and, and with and with the summer that we've just had and 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 people mobilizing much, much more than we've been mobilizing until now. I don't know. I feel like so, so that, that that's what I focus on is there's Absolutely. that little window. Let's go for it. And in, in that in that spirit, like the, the one thing that like we both in our work for at least the last 20 years have, have been somewhat localists or regionalists at heart like the the when you say we know what the solution is you and i know that the solution is refitting humanity into the scale patterns of nature mm. and that has to happen in place in community in in a region in in a specific locality that that holds all the potential and creativity that we're not going to talk about and what i find is the positive upswing of everything that's, that seems like a negative development of the last five ten, uh, to 10 years is that this conversation about relocalizing has kind of mushroomed everywhere um, in, in a new way, particularly through the pandemic now and, and the number of things like that ship in the Suez Canal. Like we, we've had a number of hits that showed us, whoa, global supply lines are incredibly brittle and, and, and they really do matter. And so suddenly the conversation around local economies, local food economies, I mean, you like some of the, the initiatives that you inspired around the world, like the, the um, food region around Liège, uh, amazing. Uh, um, how do you see, like, particularly as we move into talking about the role of art and artists, to some extent, this is about falling in love with place, falling in love, with our relationship to place and through that relearning the ancient wisdom that we're not owners of place but at the very very best at, the, at our absolute brilliance as human being we become expressions of place and custodians of place and i think artists know that in a in a way that scientists can't fully grok because scientists only use thinking and Jung had this, this beautiful mandala of thinking, sensing, feeling, and intuiting. And, and the other three, sensing, feeling, and intuiting, are about relational being. And I think that's what art is about. And you, I'd love to just hear a bit more about your story and relationship to art, because you, you went to art school before you came the found, founder of the I went to art school, school, yeah. I went yeah. to art school when I was 18. I did foundation art in Bristol. Yeah. And uh, I can't honestly say I made the best use of it particularly, but I did, I was one of the last generation of people who went to art school and on day one, they sat everybody down and said, you all think you can draw and none of you can draw. And we're gonna teach you to draw from scratch. And we spent three months doing this and uh, learning how to draw. And it was very, very boring, but it was a fantastic skill really it was i'm i'm so grateful they don't teach it very much now in in art school it's all about concepts and ideas and whatever theoretical things it's not really such a it's not such a tangible practical craft i think now um yeah so so i um <clears throat> so i did that and then i spent then I lived in Italy for three years and I traveled around in India and Pakistan and I, and I drew as I went and I tried to keep that because I, I went to, when I finished doing my foundation, I went to have an interview at Liverpool Art College. I wanted to go and do fine art at, at, and I had the most awful, humiliating interview. It was just terrible. And the interviewers were drunk and it was just, it was just, and I was like, 
I am not going to go to art school and do fine art. That's not going to happen. <clears throat> I'm going to do other things, but I'm going to keep drawing. So I kind of, I kind of kept it going a bit. And then I had kids and then, and then I went to university and then I was doing 10 million things. I, and I, and I, kind of kept it alive I used to do cartoons for the permaculture magazine and I used to do posters and stuff like that and actually it and I didn't and so then the, the two kind of moments I, I guess looking back it was really interesting what you were saying about place I really feel like all of the stuff that I've done in in Totnes since I moved here in 2005 has kind of been uh, a kind of work of art which is a sort of a kind of a love poem to Totnes somehow do you know it's like when I first came one of the first things I did was I did loads of oral history interviews with with older people about what was it like here in the 40s this what was it like here when we had no cheap energy and and uh, um, and local food systems like I have no idea and so much of what I did you know I, I remember I do did a course a few years ago with Ruth Bentovim and Lucy Neal, who are amazing, oh, yes. phenomenal. Name they, change. Yeah, they do a, they do a, um, yeah, Lucy wrote a book called Play, uh, um, Playing for Time. Play, play, yeah, play, play for and time. Uh, they, they do a course called uh, The Art of Invitation. And I did this course, The Art of Invitation. And it was really the first time, it was when was it, 2018 or something. So this was like, you know, 12, 13 years into doing transition when I really started to, to, to see the work that I did as an art practice. There's, a, there's an artist called JR, who I love in France, who does these massive paste ups. He takes photos and then blows them up massive and pastes them onto buildings. And they're very beautiful and very moving. And his website breaks all of his different projects down and as like separate art projects and describes them all. And I thought, God, I could do that. And it was a really interesting way of looking at, well, so the Totnes Pound, you know, you could look at the Totnes Pound as being an economic regeneration thing, or you could look at it as being a really quite extraordinary art project that, mm. that, that was a sort of an applied art project. And um, uh, so I started to sort of see lots and lots of the things that I had done as as being expressions of that. And so Just very briefly in parentheses, yeah. don't want to stop your flow, but for those who are listening, that's a strategy for getting really creative cultural change projects funded. The arts funding and framing them as arts projects. Yeah. And, and meet more and more creative artists like, like Lucy, who've managed to do all this amazing work that you would try to fund from some kind of systems change foundation or whatever through arts funding. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry absolutely. So, yeah. so Lucy, I think, was one of the first people who got a transition project funded by the Arts Council. They did a thing called the Trash Catchers Carnival in Tooting that was a massive street carnival all made out of waste. And they got that funded through the Arts Council. So yeah, so so that, that was a real moment for me of going, hmm, actually, I could look at everything that I've done through transition through that lens and and, and then I guess I, ha I had had this kind of slightly schizophrenic thing of thinking, well, in my time off on holiday, I do a bit of sketching and that's my art. And then the rest of the time I'm doing transition and coming up with all these crazy ideas. And, uh, and that's, that's transition, that's activism, that's a different thing. And it was the first time where they, they kind of came back together again. But then also what happened during the first lockdown was I made a very intentional uh, decision to kind of to try and reconnect with the with my drawing side and I started doing lino prints I'd watched a few videos online about how to do lino prints and found some lino print makers I really liked their stuff and then I just bought some bits of lino and some cutters and just started playing around and then about a year after that I actually had some in an exhibition which was one thing ticked off the bucket list that I'd always wanted to do that and then more recently I've been learning how to do uh dry point etching uh which has been really really lovely so it, it's like it feels like it all the, and, and then also i'm i'm involved in a project which we can talk about a bit more which i love which is working with an artist an um, um, uh, electronic music uh artist and we're doing a project together which is sort of another of my great loves as you can probably see behind me is, is music and records and and that kind of expression of it so i'm working on a project with a with a electronic music artist as well, which is another sort of beautiful expression of that. So I've really started to, I guess, kind of give myself permission more to, to, 
to kind of honor that aspect of, mm. of what it is that I do, I suppose. I think it's beautiful because you really, uh, this is really going to have an impact because I think you, you'll give other artists, because there are too many people that, have, what you just described, that schizophrenia of this is what my day job is and this is what my passion is, is common for so many artists, yeah. whether the musicians, theaters, dancers, whatever you name it. Like that's the, the main argument for having a citizen's income is like liberate all that creativity. Let's not do this on the second job after waiting or cleaning all day. Huh? Um, yeah. But but I think you you as as somebody who's seen as a person in a kind of inspirational leadership position, even if you humbly never take that mantle in any kind of egoic way, eh? um, it's just lovely to to model that. And, and I, because I, I'm sure not lots of people will not know what an amazing artist you are. I, I've been following you as you started to share um, some of your art. I, I'm I'm in love with it. I would buy. A Hopkins any day to put it on my wall and 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 you have a particularly love for Van Gogh who, who I also love a lot and just recently went to the exhibition of Van Gogh Light the this projection mm. of art um, would you do us the favor of sharing some of your art yeah I would yeah um, so so this was so th this is so this is a mixture of things this is a pen and ink picture you're talking about Van Gogh yeah mm -hmm. like I'm a massive van gogh geek and this was and so i was in Arles recently for a conference where the yellow house was and where he painted a lot of his best work and the place i'd always really wanted to visit was san remy which was the the the, the psychiatric hospital that he, mm -hmm. he he kind of um booked himself into after he cut his ear off and everything and a part of it is open and you can go and visit and he did 19 paintings out of the window of his cell which all have like this corner this walled garden with the mountains beyond mm -hmm. and so this so i went there last time i was there and this is drawn in that garden looking back towards the building that's not quite his bedroom window it's about mm -hmm. two along from his bedroom window yeah. And I absolutely cooked myself because I found this particular angle I wanted to draw and I was there was no shade. And I sat in this spot and drew this for about five hours and absolutely roasted myself. But um, yeah, I... Uh, Tell me about the process of like, how do these five hours, how do you start it? I start with pencil mm -hmm. uh -huh. and I start blocking in all the... I start by establishing all the relationships between all the different bits and getting the right shapes because once you get the under once you get the underlying shape of it right then the whole thing works if you get that wrong at the beginning it's never going to work so i do that in pencil the basic shapes and then i just start working in pen so this but this will have taken this took quite a while afterwards because the way i draw is takes so long <laughs> that actually uh you know i finished this off over like a couple of days afterwards really but, but for you internally, because like that kind of drawing has a meditative quality, both, I think, not just the reason why it has a meditative quality for the beholder is because it actually has a meditative quality for you when you're producing it. Am I wrong? Or? Yeah, there's a there's a guy I interviewed for the book uh, who I love, a guy called uh, uh, Sven, Sven Burkert. Uh, no, is that his name? Anyway, he, he, as he, he wrote this amazing book all about art and attention. And he said, basically, art is distilled attention. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at art, you're basically looking at somebody who's given their attention to something. And that then when you go and see it, then you're, you're, you're giving your attention to it. So for me, I, I can look at drawings that I did 30 years ago. And I can and I can look at the picture and I can remember what it smelled like, what it tasted like. What it felt like in that what i was what i could hear when i was drawing it you know it's like it's because i there's something about you you have to really see something you know you're really i mean that's what i love about van gogh's stuff was for me he saw the world in a way that Dy dynamic like the, the dynamism a living a living moving kind of uh pulsating uh you know he he i mean it was it took a huge burden on him but he was able to to see the world in in a way that was he could see life basically he could see life in a way that that you know that's 
uh, and he, and he he always tr he always had this thing of you know when he was when he was living with Gauguin in in Arles and where they kept coming they they had that big sort of falling out was because Gauguin kept saying paint from your imagination paint from your imagination and from Van it's like why would I do that the natural world is so <laughs> extraordinary and utterly more exquisite than anything I could ever possibly imagine it's really about how do I bring my bring my complete focus to it you know um, I think what he was grappling with in his way is what Blake spoke to and what Goethe spoke to, um, which actually takes us to some extent to this fundamental change in narrative that is the change of the cultural shift we open up with. <laughs> like, how do we not dismiss the gifts of science and technology, but understand that they made us blind, just like Blake warned us 200 years ago, may God us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. And what you're speaking to in that experience as, as an artist in, in sensing, smelling, tasting something that happened 30 years ago, that's exactly it. The qualitative experience of life as a process in which the mind meets its wider context, in which the supposed individual meets the larger context that actually makes us able to be individuals and it's it's this dance this like what indigenous cultures always understand that we are what we're looking at that i think that the the artist or, or goethe was really the first phenomenologist before the field of phenomenology was even founded like he he was so keenly interested in exactly that how how as an artist do i bring the world into being through my way of seeing and my my relating as an artist does that does that make any sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and 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 i th i think for me it's you know bringing it back to what we were talking yeah. about at the beginning it's like you know something people say quite a lot you know we will only say you only save something if you love it and we have to fall back in love with the world and we have to feel enchanted and endlessly curious about the world and for me that's what that's what you know you look at van gogh's stuff i mean there's you know millions of other artists but for me it's like you know he he got out of bed at the crack of dawn every morning and he could do like two paintings in a day he was just like on fire yeah. <clears throat> with this sort of love of the world and trying to capture the world and and that he he didn't just sort of always paint the most beautiful things. Some of his most beautiful pictures were like a bunch of weeds around the back of the public baths. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or some factory in a field, or uh, he could he could find what was um, he could he could f kind of find the sacred in anything. He could mm -hmm. find he could find the exquisite in anything. I, you, you, you know why I think that is what what I kind of got when I watched that light exhibition recently and also looking at some of his very famous paintings is that to my mind, I mean, this is complete projection and conjecture here but for, for me, from my experience of his art, he's not painting objects. He's painting the dynamics that our worldview solidifies into objects. Mm. He, he got from the beginning that what Heraclitus called Pantare, that everything flows, nothing stays the same, everything transforms. When you look at those cypresses or that starry night, night sky, it, it's the dynamism of it all that it, it's almost like he's painting the relationships rather than the objects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what was so amazing with this place where I went to draw this was when you like all of those paintings that we most well, not all but a lot of the ones that we really associate with the cypresses the olive groves the quarry all those things are around here so when you come out of this building onto the street you're like oh cypresses i was like oh my god it was just it was just uh it was just magical so i show you a couple of other yeah ones. yeah please this is a cafe i saw in switzerland recently like the, i just sat by this cafe and drew that a caravan when I was on holiday with a Betty Boop towel um, hanging on the line. That's on the beach in Brittany in in France where we went on holiday. That's in um, a place called Monastère de Segrier, I think, that I went to an event at uh, in the south of France. It's a beautiful kind of cloistered courtyard. 
That's a print. So that, that's a dry point print of some trees near where I live. That's um, mm, Brussels. That that's in Brussels, just near the road. So just to the right is a really busy main road. <laughs> Sorry, I managed to find some trees. That's in uh, Barcelona, uh, public square in Barcelona. So for me, what I'm always look, interested in is light uh, mm. and sort of trying to capture light, really. That's that other one again. Um, I was going to show you some of the, as well, some of the ones that I did. These, so these are some of the lino prints that mm -hmm. I did during lockdown. Yeah. yeah. That's my, wow. my lounge, some flowers. Uh, See, this, they, these, these have a very like strong kind of Van Gogh-esque quality to, to me. And again, like the, the, the one that just, got the, the cornflowers, that one, yeah, they, Again, they, they show dynamism, but relationships. Yeah. Yeah, that's a place called the Buttercup Field, just near my house. That's the Buttercup Field as well. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, there's a few bits and bobs. Uh, that's a house plant in my house. Yeah, so there's a few bits anyway. Mm. Um, yeah. And the and how, the, because you were also mentioning a kind of crossover project into music, how, yeah. how relate with the with the paint? Is it related to the trust? Not really? I mean, I guess it's the same. Yeah. It's the same. So, so I listen to a lot of kind of ambient electronic music. It's something mm -hmm. that I really fell in love with during COVID, because I could. I could work, I could listen to it and work. Anything that has a beat, anything that has lyrics, I can't concentrate. But that particular sort of genre of ambient music is such a huge field and, and I can listen to it and I can concentrate. And, um, and so I'm always exploring different ways that, so the poet Rilke once said something like, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens, which is mm. so beautiful future must enter into you a long time before i have first time i heard it it nearly made me cry it's like it's just that's what we need to be doing for me as activists if we're going to get through that window however small that window might be the only way we're going to get through it is because we cultivated the 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 longing such a deep intense longing to get there and i saw a t-shirt that somebody was wearing during the Black Lives Matter protest in Washington in 2020. It said, I've been to the future, we won. That is just, I love it. It's beautiful. And, it, and again, it gave me goosebumps. And I'm like, okay, how do we in 2022 give people a lived experience of what that 2030 could be like if we got there mm. in a way because we're surrounded by idiot politicians and media people who would have you believe that a low carbon 2030 we'd all be living in a cave eating green potatoes and we'd all have rickets and it would be miserable and horrible and we'd all have tb and for me it's like how do we give people a kind of an immersive taste of what it could be like so so this project is called uh, field recordings from the future and the idea is that i go to visit things that exist now and that work now even if they're on quite a small scale but things that that give a feeling of what that future will sound like and then I go and record them and then he builds a track that is built around those field recordings so there's a whole sort of genre within ambient music of people who use field recordings uh, mm -hmm. as the basis of what they do so the first track I went to Marseille and I went to this amazing restaurant, which is the first restaurant I've heard of where they cook using the heat from the sun. They have a big mirrored dish out the back. <laughs> like all of them. It focuses the heat into the back of the cooker and they cook amazing food on it. And so I interviewed the guy who was about to build a, it was just in a, like a shipping container, but he'd got planning permission to build a whole proper restaurant, a wooden restaurant with gardens and ponds and so on and so on. So I, I interviewed him and, and said, Imagine it's 2030, you've built your restaurant, it's been open for five years, describe it to me. And he just did the most beautiful job in this really sing-song French, oh, it's so lovely, you could come, and oh, it's so beautiful, and look, you see the gardens, everyone said we were crazy, and now look, it's just so beautiful. And we, so that was the first track, we, he then built this gorgeous thing based on that. We've done one 
based on a uh, on a kind of regenerative farm near where I live, which is based on recordings I did there. We've done we're doing one at the moment, which is about um, an underground mushroom farm in the middle of Brussels that I went to. I went to the Vauban, Vauban, Vauban mm -hmm. in, in Freiburg recently, mm -hmm. which is the, the car-free neighborhood there, 3,000 mm -hmm. people in the car-free neighborhood, which, because I wanted to record what, is, what, would, a, what would a car-free city sound like? And so mm -hmm. I spent two days there just recording noises and sounds, and, uh, and then I'm going to go to Utrecht uh, in a couple of weeks to record Bicycle Rush Hour. Uh, and then we'll do something with that. I've done a load of recordings. I went to an amazing beaver rewilding project near where I live. I'm going to go and visit a project which is welcoming refugees uh, into the UK and to, to, to do something that's based on that. So for mm. me, when it's all together, when all the tracks are put together, that's the idea that it's a kind of an immersive walkthrough of that future in a way that you can you can almost touch it. Okay, this sparked a whole number of things. Like first, a couple of chicks are already aware of it. I once went to a really interesting conference that was called Now, Now Assembly, Nature of Wonder. And I met an Italian acoustic biologist who studies the sound recordings of pristine high biodiversity rainforests and compares those sound recordings with rainforests that are already degraded. And, and based on these, the dimensionality and the, the, like they can tell all the different calls, what's what, they, they can actually get a very active profile of how healthy the environment is. And he took bringing it home to art. He actually created, this, is, this is, has already happened and will start touring. He created a, like a Bucky Fuller geodesic dome traveling exhibition that you can take to any major square anywhere in the world to give people a lived experience of a healthy rainforest soundscape wow. with, the, with the best Bose surround sound, like sound engineers going completely geeky crazy to make this perfect. Uh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll send you some, some links. I think, I think that, that that was one thing that came to mind. Also, with all your recordings, I, I thought I know a German broadcaster who'd probably really enjoy doing a show with you once you've done this stuff. So, so just take the note and I'll put you in touch. But the other thing is, do you, do you know John Seed and Ruth Rosneck and, and Chris Johnson? Ben? Like they, they had a band in the 90s called Dreambeat. Did, did you ever come I across that? No, no, no. Well, John, John Seed, founder of know, one, the Deep Ecology Movement, you probably know him personally, they created this, they, they, look, look it up, I think John, it's actually somewhere downloadable, I probably find it, um, you can also send it, they, they basically messaged um, Deep Ecology messages about human nature relationship and relationship to life um, through mainly ambient music, slightly sort of um, Little Fluffy Cloud style um, <laughs> songs. Um, and, but they also did, there's one that I remember, which was, was the universe rap, which was like the first verse of the universe, pour forth like a sea of mystery out of the void manifest silence, space time comes into existing, Spur spurling, furling masses of he helium, hydrogen, when the divine is revealed, and I can't remember the whole whole thing. It's it's really beautiful. Like um, was it something helium? Da, da, da. The law of attraction, powerful forces, universe action. Anyway, beautiful. I'll, I'll, I'll find it to you. But we're in a long tradition there that I think is so aligned with what we're what this series to me is about. Because I, it's not just about visual artists, like I, I've had conversations with the people who run playing, um, and that one's called Playing for Change, the platform where musicians all over the world like record famous tracks and decentralized. Oh well, yeah, I've seen some of those, yeah, they're amazing. They're beautiful, yeah, and the guy who, who made, the, made that happen, he's, he's fully aligned with us. Like if we ever wanted to create like collaborations to support messaging through music he he's really keen and, and, and in many ways i think your work already is inspiring lots of artists to step into that space and i hope that this series is also like really a call out to the creative industries the creatives out there 
that's what shaped culture always. It's, it, it only starts shifting when they write plays about it, when they write poems about it, when they sing songs about it. Uh, well, well, Walida Imarisha, who's an amazing artist, a, a writer in the US, who edited a, a collection called Octavia's Brood that was based on the work of Octavia Butler. She mm -hmm. said, all, uh, all organizing is science fiction. All organizing is science fiction. Basically, any any effective social change movements are storytelling. You know, it's it's that's what we're doing. We're telling a different story about how the future could be and using storytelling to open up those those possibilities. And there's uh, uh, Amanda Scott and people have been working on the and Rupert Reed, I think, coined this idea of this term throughtopian, which I just mm -hmm. love it. It's the, the, the idea that we that, that through topian stories are not are not stories about what the what a utopia could be like because you never get to a utopia but through topian stories are the stories about how it started where did it start Who, what happened in 2022 that kicked started this whole process running what did they do who did they meet so um uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future is is kind of one example of that but she's trying to coordinate lots of people uh, to do that, and I think we we absolutely need a sort of uh, um, a huge number of, of of stories like that because because it's the stories that are going to win this. Really. But, but, but let me just check something with you because in in my own like I I agree, and I'm also beginning to sense into something that is more in terms of the. The mental scaffolding that keeps us, like Bayor Komalafa says, maybe it's our response to the crisis that is part of the crisis. Um, so, what is it? What are the mental patterns of that we're still not questioning enough? And I'm I'm wondering to what extent that whole past, future, present, the, the relationship, like not like artists always enabled us to have a conversation about the multi-dimensionality of time. And and even like to bring it back to the poem, po uh, to, to the poet, to Rilke, uh, your Rilke quote. One of my favorite Rilke quotes is at the end of this beautiful poem, Dear Darkening Brown, where after describing basically the moment we now live in a hundred years ago, like he actually calls it the moment, the inexplicable moment, no, the, the moment of inexplicable terror when you take back your name from all things and become water in widening wilderness again. Boom. And then silence. And then give me just a little more time. Give me just a little more time. So I may love the things until they're real and ripe and worthy of you. Mm. And this, this is the other dimension that is even more imminent than the future, like bringing the future, inhabiting the future. He's speaking to the same thing. It's what my, my mentor from the International Futures Club, Anthony Hodgson, calls the future potential of the present moment. It's esoterically speaking, J.G. Bennett's hypoxis understanding of time. Um, it's, it's a manifest that, that it's, it's the realization that we will never be anywhere else but the present and that the whole framing of some future that we need to arrive at and that we're not already there is already misleading. That what we can actually get through the immediacy and the multi-sensory reality of the artistic medium is a return to the power of the presence in community and in place. Mm. And that's a very different way of working. That's how indigenous people became expressions of place, of cultural impulse. And, and, and it also links to the, the, what you were speaking to with like rooting in the past, where did it start? It's the reframe, and this is really important, I think, in terms of all the pictures that really inspired people around transition towns and how could we live in the future. Um, if we keep projecting utopias artistically, creatively, wonderfully visioning them, there still remain utopias. And the world looks really dismal and a lot of people don't have the belief that we can manifest those utopias. But if we retell the narrative 
that we are not a cancer on the planet, that there's 8 billion of us, and that in each and our, every one of our cells is life's regenerative impulse at work, renewing itself all the time. We are life renewing itself as we're speaking right now. And therefore, we as human beings have the innate capacity of being regenerative custodians within an ecosystem, bioregional landscape system. We, like even scientifically, like you, you, you and I know enough science to know that life, the evolutionary process, might forgive a species 5,000 years or maybe even 10,000 years or a part, a small part of a species to be completely mistaken and maladaptive and kill a lot of life along with it. We've kind of seen it in recent history. But life doesn't forget, forgive a species 50,000 years, 100,000 years, or a long journey of a hominid lineage. That means that for most of our journey, we were regenerative cultures in action. Yeah. And so we are going back. We're indigenous to life, and life is fundamentally regenerative from the beginning. And with art and with everything, that like it's, it's just a small but important reframe of everything you're doing into the immediacy of the present moment a little like we still need to co-vision how can we change our community and all of that is important but with the awareness that really the, the the magic juice the real reframe is how do we relate to each other this place now and the the future potential of the present moment and and, and Rilke with love gives us gives the, the hint <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely i mean I, I guess a couple of thoughts that come to me here when you're speaking there is is firstly i never talk about utopias mm -hmm. because i think utopias aren't that helpful and so what i always in every workshop that i do and or talk i always do my time machine exercise where i tell them i've got a time machine and, and, and i built it during lockdown and we're going to use it to travel forwards but i always say we're not going to a utopia we're not going to a dystopia. We're traveling forward to a 2030 that is the result of us having done everything we could possibly have done during those eight years. So it felt like an exhilarating time to be alive. I use, it's what we do at the beginning of every episode of the podcast I do as well. So rather than talking about is a universal basic income a good idea, we go to a 2030 where they've already had one for six years. And what does, how does the air smell different? What, what does it feel like? What, you know, it's, so it's not, it's not a utopia it's something that is more kind of within reach just about and it's something that's still work in progress and it's not perfect and climate change hasn't disappeared and uh but it's but it's it's allowing people i think to 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 see beyond where they are now and to just keep that possibility um open a little bit one of the stories that i always tell people the beginning of talks is about the moon you know that actually we all we we spent centuries longing to go to the moon and people told stories about going to the moon and then when we realized it was actually a planet a round thing near us then people started to tell stories about how we got there and jules verne written his book uh, from the earth to the moon in 19 in 1865 got together all the best science he could find about how we might actually get there. And then that book inspired loads of scientists and engineers who were then really excited about that. And then they wrote books about how we might actually do it. And then the, and then the storytellers wrote stories about there. And it was this backwards and forwards between storytellers and uh, filmmakers then and cartoonists and Tintin went to the moon and uh, uh, Frank Sinatra sang us to the moon and everybody went to the moon. All kinds of ludicrous films were made about going to the moon and loads that were actually 30 or so years before we actually went were, un were uncannily close to what actually happened when we went there because the reality was kind of then also led by the storytelling. And it meant that when Kennedy announced in 1962 we were gonna to go to the moon, that we did it kind of from scratch in seven years and the average age of the team that did it was, was 26. And, uh, and the woman that wrote the woman that wrote the code herself to do all the calculations to take people to the moon has been forgotten. She's an yeah. African American woman. That, I've, so, I've seen this picture of her, like a short woman with a pile of code print out papers, yeah. taller than her. And just yeah, and, and but it's, it's like, but for me, the thing is that the the I read a book that said you know that basically what Jules Verne's book did was it created the longing. 
The longing was then in the culture. And once that longing was in the culture, it was kind of inevitable. There's a beautiful cartoon that Hergé, who drew the Tintin cartoons, did of Tintin and Snowy and Captain Haddock and Professor Calculus greeting Neil Armstrong when he steps onto the moon with a bunch of flowers, because we'd already been there, you know, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And we need to do that. Um, we need to we need to do that kind of storytelling in a much shorter period of time because we don't have the time they had for that. And just one other thing that came to mind when you were talking was when you were talking about, you know, people seeing us as being a cancer on the planet. You know, one of the loveliest bits uh, in this field recordings from the future project that I'm doing with uh, with this with this guy, he's got a guy called Mr. Kit. It was there's a it was, it's a it's a really nice story that I, that I I I. There's a particular track that I just love that's done by this guy called Mr. Kit and it's called um, Girl Walking on the Beach Wearing a Skirt. And it's a beautiful mixture of ambient music and field recordings that he made in Thailand, I think. And it ends with a kind of community on the beach watching a firework display. And it's really evocative of people and community and place. And I absolutely love it. And you'd find it on YouTube. And I thought, if I do this field recordings from the future project, I'd love to work with him. I wonder who this guy is. And then I looked him up and he lived in my town. And it turned out he used to DJ with my son when they used to have a little sound system when they were like 19. So I was like, this is just ridiculous. And so one of the recordings that we did with Apricot Farm, which is near where I live, we interviewed Caroline Aiken, who's a permaculture designer uh, here. And she and the quote that we ended up using from her in the track is where she's talking about she's speaking from 2030 looking back. And she says, you know, one of the things at the time was that our language around conservation was that we had to minimize our impact, minimize our impact, because our impact was such a bad thing. And actually what we realized was that was that we we, we, we change things so that our impact was a good thing and that our impact was regenerative and that everything that we did had a different impact and so the narrative then became about more and more because we because we were then rolling that out so mm -hmm. so so just to reassure you that that that, that is enshrined beautiful. this project beautiful no I, I i mean that's exactly the kind of visioning we need it, and you all, i mean you it, this was not a critique in any way uh, like it was saying it's it's just in terms of making it more explicit for people that the real magic like we need to envision these futures but the 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 seeds of being in that future are in the present already here in the relationships of people caring of love like the more we make people fall in love with each other and the place and step out of the the mental conceptions of like the sort of i mean you, you this would be an interesting thing to also talk about like christopher alexander's critique to permaculture and which is kind of related to that, like the scientific whole systems design. We, we, we need one of those. We need one of those. We need one of those. And now bring them all together as opposed to the more phenomenological unveiling of what that unique place and that unique culture want to bring forth, have the potential of bringing forth in that particular place. It's, it's a different way of working with wholeness. One of them is kind of the additive wholeness. And that's the danger, I think, of the when we envision future scenarios too much is the like we just build a sort of off the shelf regenerative community in our neighborhood and instead of growing it out of the moment. But I think with with the way you're working with it by using the imagination and bringing in the kind of describe it invites people into a much more multi central relationship with that future. Uh, yeah. yeah yeah i mean that's for me it's like so i so i do this time machine exercise in workshops with 10 people and i've done it with at an event with one and a half thousand people in a hall in uh, levan la neuve in uh, in brussels near belgium near, near, near sorry in, in belgium near brussels and the thing that is always fascinates me about it is that is how common it is. It is how is how common the the results are, the, the the responses are. People say, "Oh, you know, I um, the bird song's much louder, the air's much cleaner, there's much less cars, there's a stronger sense of shared purpose, there's people growing food, people's work is different, it's much more meaningful." You know, it's not like, it's not really specific in terms of the the 
down to building design and, and details mm -hmm. like that. But for me, what it, it there's the it, it allows people to access a quality that bypasses the economy that we're in now, because neoliberal capitalism is about selling people uh, dopamine basically and when that's your economy you just see it you inevitably see a rise of addiction and depression and that's how it is what that exercise does is it allows people to bypass that into what would a future based on contentment and happiness and community uh and conviviality look like and uh and, and for me it's like th that no one ever says oh we've got a new ikea it's four times bigger than the one we had in 2022 or <laughs> my iphone 86 now can make toast or something you know it's really it's really a, there's a, a it's a quality that i want people to then experience and and the thing that i keep coming back to with people is why do we not start there you know i've done that with with hundreds and hundreds of groups now and mm -hmm. and 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 it's so common what people say and I wonder why we don't have political movements that say, we're going to start there. It's going to, be, da, 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 and then we're going to work backwards how we're going to get there. But we're going to put the vision and the dream in front of us. You know, we did that in the 1960s. You know, JFK did it, um, <clears throat> not JFK, sorry. Um, Martin Luther King did it, uh, Bobby Kennedy did it. And then we just sort of lapsed into this sort of incremental politics of everything being in little steps. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like, we need to be we need to put storytelling back and we need to put that we need to put that in front of us it's about you can create a north star without without over specifying it i think the, mm. the north star becomes something that you you feel in your guts it's like it's like that like rilke's future enters inside you it's not like down to the nuts and bolts and the specifics but it's like the it's like the feeling of it that the longing it's a, yeah, it's all about longing for me, and so I'm always looking for those different ways to create that that kind of sense of longing, really. L longing, belonging, and falling in love, I think, are, are very related there. And I, I know you you've got to go, and we're going. To <laughs> which is why, to which is why, just to end on, yeah. uh, uh, "Be My Baby" by the Ronettes is the greatest pop song anybody ever wrote because it is about it is. It is about longing in a way. It's it's the most heartbreaking song about longing, and and the, it makes me cry every time I hear it. And it's absolutely exquisitely beautiful. Uh, we'll, we'll listen to. I think whoever cuts this bit together. Yeah, is, do do. do, do. <laughs> this is the it's trail. about beauty. Yeah. It's about love. It's about longing. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. This has been really rich, and I wish we could had another hour, but it's probably wise we we at this late. In the <laughs> we will, and very soon we will actually get together in person, and we'll have a beer, and we can keep this conversation around a campfire going into the small hours. It'd be lovely. And a